René Descartes conceived the universe as a big universal machine with atoms moving across the ether. As a machine that, like a clock, moves automatically and deterministically. Likewise, the nervous system, as part of that universe, is also a machine, in this case with tubes through which animal spirits, something like energy, travel and activate other parts of the body, causing their movement. But for him, the mind was different. The mind is an immaterial entity, what he called a res cogitans, which means a thinking thing, as opposed to the res extensa, which is something that have, has extension in space. The mind is not extended in space. The mind is indivisible, and because the brain or the nervous system has parts, then the brain cannot be the mind. The mind is in contact with God, who gave humans a conscious, rational and willing mind. So all humans have the potential of being rational beings. If they are not, it is because they use their faculties in the wrong way. The mind is connected with the body through the pineal gland in the brain. The interaction with the brain is in two directions. Some things happening in the body reach the pineal gland in the brain, and whatever is in the pineal gland is sort of observed by the mind. The contemporary American philosopher Daniel Dennett referred to this as the Cartesian theater. Remember that uh, Cartesian comes from Cartesius, which was the, is the Latin name for Descartes. So that Cartesian theater is in the pineal gland, and it is uh, things that happen, in, that happen in the body are, have some representation in the pineal gland, that, which is the stage of that theater, and the mind is the audience of that theater. Of course, Dennett uh, criticized strongly this view, but I'm not going to talk about this in this lecture. The other direction of uh, the connection between mind and body is from the mind to the body. So when the mind makes a decision, it transmits that decision through the pineal gland to the body, so the body makes a movement. So Descartes arrived to this conclusion following a method, a method he used to acquire certain universal knowledge, a knowledge that cannot be doubted. So in order to reach that knowledge, he started to doubt about everything. He started to doubt about not reality, he didn't uh, deny the existence of an external world to the mind, um, but he doubted that the way we perceive the world is, is real. Sorry, it's not is real, that it is um, certain. So he, had, uh, he developed this uh, called the evil demon argument, and uh, the evil de demon argument has uh, more um, modern versions. One is called the brain in the vat, in which a brain is, is uh, maintained in a, in a dish with um, uh, fluids that maintain it alive and is connected to a computer, and the computer um, sends um, activations to the brain, so the brain is um, perceiving something, but in reality it's not real, because it's just a, uh, a representation in a computer. And uh, another version of that is the, uh, the film The Matrix, so The Matrix in the film, in the 1999 uh, sci uh, science fiction film The Matrix, uh, by which we live in a uh, in a world created by someone else. So he called that uh, this uh, evil demon that he may, may be 
he is deceiving him and creating images in him that are um, similar to the ones that we perceive um, when we are dreaming. So, based on that argument, he said, well, I cannot, although I, I, there is a reality out there, I, my senses are not a good, um, uh, I cannot trust that they give a certain knowledge about what is out there. Uh, but, he said, because I doubt about this, uh, and because I, I, it is possible that I am de deceived by the evil demon, that means that in order to be deceived, I have to think. And that is absolutely certain. I can doubt about everything except one thing, that I am thinking. And based on that, he had um, this phrase in Latin, cogito ergo sum, which translates as, I think, therefore I am, or sometimes translated as, I am conscious, therefore I exist. So that's the beginning of um, the mind-body dualism developed by Descartes, by which we have an immaterial mind and on, on the one hand and on the other hand a material mechanistic universe within which the body of the human body and the brain uh, is located and therefore is also mechanical. Okay, criticisms to that view were immediate. Uh, in a nice tradition Descartes sent his book of meditations to um, commentators. One of the commentators was Thomas Hobbes. And um, so before publishing, he um, received the comments and he published the comments of the, in, of the commentators and his responses. So Thomas Hobbes um, criticized strongly the um, idea of an immaterial mind. Uh, so he said, he objected Descartes' conclusion that because he thinks, he is thinking. Uh, this is equivalent to say that because one walks, then one is a walking. Instead, one is something, an organism that thinks, or an organism that walks. One is not a thinking, one, not, one is not walking. And so for Thomas Hobbes, mind is matter, it's not different than matter. So this is the materialistic view of, in the mind-body problem. And the materialistic view in the mind-body problem continued um, in the 18th century. One of the main exponents was uh, Julien de la Métrie, a French physician who wrote the book Man and Machine, in which, um, in a flamboyant way, he postulated the idea of the brain as a mechanical machine and the mind is nothing else but what the brain does. And this view is now is con contemporary uh, scientists and philosophers ascribe to some aspects of this uh, view of the universe. Probably the main exponent of this view is uh, Patricia Charchlan, a Canadian philosopher, um, who developed the idea of a reductionist, um, a reductionism or eliminative uh, materialism. So basically, the, talks about uh, mental uh, concepts, um, psychological concepts, it's actually can be reduced to uh, concepts about brain structures, brain processes. We don't need the uh, mental concepts. Okay, so 
but uh, the mat materialism was also criticized and um, these um, debates about materialism and, and, and the problems of uh, ma materialistic um, philosophy are happening at the moment so we are not going to provide a solution to this now just to mention one um, idea that Immanuel Kant in the 18th century proposed it was that the mind is not mechanical like the materialistic view suggests it constructs reality is active and it constructs reality therefore the knowledge we have about reality is limited uh, so this is in terms of uh, matter yeah the universe is is um, material but because our mind we we perceive the world through our uh, not mechanical mind that just copies what happens in the world but a mind that constructs the world then we don't have access to how the world is in this sense uh, is um, Cartesian uh, in a Cartesian idea now this I this idea of Kant was further developed by the German idealists um, who uh, just uh, exaggerated these and uh, proposed a, a mind independent of the world and rather than independent so basically even putting into question whether the world exists and everything is mind so a, a, uh, someone who followed the Kantian um, ideas was the German uh, physicist um, and physiologist and philosopher Hermann von Helmholtz in the 19th century and basically what he, he took Kant's idea and he got rid of all the the idealism of um, Hegel, Fichte and other German idealists and basically he says that we have an active mind, uh, a mind that makes inferences about the world, but this is a mind that we can study by studying the brain with physiological methods. <laughs>